Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the first presentation of our four-week speaker series on the capitalist mode of power. Uh, this speaker series has received the kind sponsorship of the Department of Political Science at York and also the Graduate Programme in Social and Political Thought. Next Tuesday, uh, Jordan Brennan, an economist at the newly formed Canadian super union Unifor, will be presenting on inequality and corporate power in the very same room at the very same time. On Wednesday, November the 13th, James McMahon over here uh, will be talking about risk, creativity, and the Hollywood film business. And finally, on Tuesday, November the 19th, DT Cochrane will be presenting on the nexus between the social construction of romance and the diamond business. Uh, this speaker series coincides with the launching of a new website, capitalistpower.com here, as you can see, just behind me. This website includes blog posts, working papers, articles, and a discussion forum that explore power restructuring in the past, in the present, and in the future. We hope that capitalistpower.com will become a veritable hub for cutting-edge research on the most important power process that shapes our world today, that being the power process of capital accumulation. Uh, we encourage you to check out the website and to participate in its evolution. Without further ado, I will introduce you to Jonathan Nitsen. Jonathan is a professor of political economy at the Department of Political Science at York, and uh, he's also um, affiliated with the graduate program in social and political thought. Uh, before coming to York in the late 1990s, uh, Jonathan was a senior editor of emerging markets at the BCA Research Group. Along with Shimshon Bishler, Jonathan is the major architect of the Capital as Power framework. For over 20 years, Nitsan and Bishler have culled a number of sacred cows in both neoclassical economics and radical political economy. Perhaps their most important contribution lies in their pioneering reconceptualization of value theory and capitalist crisis. Today, Jonathan will offer us his and Bishler's latest findings in this venture. He will speak for about an hour and 20 minutes and we'll have plenty of time to engage in the question and answer session afterwards. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. I hope it will be worth your while. Uh, recovery. It seems that uh, almost every expert uh, on economics, politics, finance is concerned with the prospect of recovery. The world remains mirrored in a very serious crisis, and the key question seems to be how to get out of this crisis. Today, I'd like to ask a very different question, and this is whether capitalists are interested in a recovery to begin with, whether they can afford a recovery. And this question, I think, does not come out of the blue. Over the past uh, several years, Shimshon and myself have written a number of uh, papers on the crisis. And our argument in these papers was that this was a systemic crisis and that capitalists have been struck by systemic fear. In other words, fear for the very existence of their system. The fear and the crisis, we argued, were objectively grounded. They were grounded, though, in a way that is quite different from the explanation given by heterodox political economists, particularly Marxists. For the Marxists, at least for most of them, this crisis is the culmination of a long process of weakening accumulation. We argued to the contrary that this is a sign of the incredible strength of accumulation. And this very significant difference between these two approaches is anchored in very different cosmologies, diff very different ways of understanding capitalism. For mainstream economists and for Marxist political economists, capitalism is a system of production 
and consumption. It's a mode of production and consumption. We view uh, capitalism as a mode of power and capital as power. And looking at capital as power and researching uh, its recent performance, we came to the uh, tentative conclusion that capital accumulation has been approaching its asymptotes or limits recently. And this is a very significant conclusion because if you think of capital as power, that means that capitalists, in order to accumulate, have to engage in strategic forms of sabotage. They have to inflict damage or threaten to inflict damage on society. And the greater the power, the more difficult it is for capitalists to increase it even further because that means inflicting greater damage and greater sabotage on society. And of course, when you do that, uh, inevitably at some point you start to elicit resistance and perhaps even a serious form of resistance. Capitalists have no choice though. If capital is power, then accumulation means increasing that power. It means uh, increasing sabotage. And that is something that capitalists are not only conditioned to do, but they are compelled to do by the very essence of the system. And we suggested that uh, beginning in the early 2000s, capitalists started to realize that they are approaching those asymptotes, that they are approaching those limits. And because their outlook is very forward-looking, and because financial markets and the process of capitalization is based on looking forward, we get the discounting of that very negative sentiment back into assets, and we have a major bear market that uh, the world political economy has been uh, stuck in for uh, the last decade or so. Now, what I'd like to do today is to try to situate this type of analysis uh, and understand it through the spectacles of economic policy. And the structure of the presentation is divided into three parts. The first part deals with the macroeconomic creed. For mainstream economists, most of the theoretical questions uh, are, already be, uh, are already solved. So the question is practical. How do we engineer, bring about a recovery? The Marxists ask a completely different question. They ask the question of whether a recovery is possible in the first place, because they are concerned with the contradictions that capitalism is based on. So that will be the second part of me, my presentation, trying to assess the claims and uh, empirical evidence in support of the Marxist position. And finally, I'll come to the uh, perspective of capital as power. And here it is where I will ask the question, of whether capitalists are indeed interested in recovery, can they afford a recovery, and given the question that I will give, uh, what does that mean for the years to come? So let's begin with the macroeconomic creed. Uh, and the first thing I want to look at is some expressions of the systemic fear I was talking about. So the sense of systemic fear uh, started to emerge, we argue, in the early 2000s, but its explicit expression appeared mostly after the deep plunge in 2008. So the first quote is from Alan Greenspan, who was then uh, formerly the, uh, Fed of, uh, the chair of the Federal Reserve Board in uh, the United States. Alan Greenspan uh, was nix, nicknamed the Maestro, uh, where I worked at uh, the bank credit analyst, they used to call him God. And uh, in 2008, he gave a testimony uh, to a congressional committee, and he said, quote, the whole intellectual edifice collapsed in the summer of last year. And he confessed that he and his like uh, were in a state of shocked disbelief. The models basically broke down, and not, not, not only the model of the Fed, where he argues that he has uh, 200 PhDs, all the smartest of the smartest, but in every other major institution. Uh, the Financial Times, ostensibly uh, the most important daily uh, of uh, the capitalist mode of power, writes, 
uncertainty is the only certain thing in this crisis. Uh, Julian, uh, Gillian Tett, who is uh, a very smart journalist working for the Financial Times, summarizes the situation by saying the pillars of faith on which this new financial capitalism will build have all but collapsed. And that collapse has left everyone from finance minister or central banker to small investor or pension holder bereft of an intellectual compass dazed and confused. This is 2009 uh, and the f four or five years since these quotes the situation hasn't changed by much. Capitalists and mostly their uh, policy makers remain in a state of great confusion. This is uh, a quote from a report on a meeting of central bankers in 2013. And remember, central bankers are the ones who are supposed to know better than anybody else what is going on. Some of the leading figures in central banking conceded that they were flying blind when steering their economies. That they are, in fact, in an uncharted territory. I mean, this is what they're saying, not what we are saying on them. So what is going on? What is this context that raises this massive confusion uh, and those uh, signs of vibrations in the mainstream dogma? Why is this systemic fear? In order to put things in context, the first chart uh, shows you annual growth rates in the world beginning in 2000. And you have three series. <coughs> uh, the black line is for the world as a whole. The dotted line is for developing and emerging countries. And the red uh, dotted line is for the advanced countries. And what we see is a general slide since the beginning of the 2000s. So we see the first crisis of the early 2000s, uh, which did not push uh, the world economy into negative territory. We see a recovery following that. And then in 2008, we see uh, a major plunge. The world economy has gone to minus 3% contraction, and the advanced countries contracted by approximately 5%. Uh, then was a swift recovery, but it was very short. And again, the slide continues. So the world economy currently is growing at about 2%, and the developed countries are pretty much at a standstill. Now this is a serious situation and in order to understand the seriousness of that situation we need some analytical context and that context is given by this very simple equation titled decomposing GDP. Now this equation is inspired by David Hume, the famous uh, British philosopher who invented the dichotomy between the real and the nominal spheres. So there's the real world in which production and consumption and utility and well-being and all those things happen. And there's the nominal world of prices and money, which is mostly a reflection, a mirror, and perhaps a lubricator of the real sphere. Now, this division is something that is common and accepted uh, among all political economists, be they on the far right or the far left. And it is informing the national accounts everywhere. And that's what we have in equation one. If you look at nominal GDP, and that is the dollar value of the gross domestic product, everything that is produced in an economy in a particular period of time, say a year, it's a product of two components. One is the real GDP, everything that is produced in real terms, quote unquote. And if, if you take that basket of everything that is produced, in real terms, and you multiply it by its average price, which is the nominal GDP deflator, you get the GDP in dollar terms, in nominal terms. So there are two components that actually make the nominal GDP, the real GDP, and the price deflator. And they are indicated by these symbols. Y is for nominal GDP, Q is for real GDP, and P is for the price level. Now, until 1930, or until the 1930s, the liberal dogma was that policy intervention by government uh, 
was unnecessary and harmful. It was unnecessary <coughs> because it was assumed that the economy is always hovering around its full equilibrium capacity. And uh, if for some reason it's deviating from it, there are market forces that quickly bring it back. So there's no need to intervene. Secondly, uh, intervention was not only unnecessary but harmful because if the government intervenes, it does so through changing nominal GDP. If it can no longer affect real GDP, the effect is going to be only on the price level. So there's going to be inflation or deflation depending on the nature of the intervention. So government should stay out. And uh, parenthetically, it's worthwhile to mention that Marx was holding a similar position in saying that uh, large government is probably bad for accumulation because a large government has to be financed through taxation and taxation can be imposed only on capitalists, only on the surplus because workers already earn only subsistence wages so you cannot tax them. And therefore that is going to detract from the surplus and harm accumulation. So that was more or less the conventional view that government, uh, as far as capitalists are concerned, should stay out. That view was shattered by the Great Depression. And uh, the Great Depression showed that a large proportion of the labor force can remain out of work, uh, and a large chunk of the productive capacity can be under or not utilized at all. And there is nothing that actually uh, seems to bring the economy back to its full capacity. Now, that was obvious to anybody who uh, could see, but it was not obvious to the economists. And the reason is that the economists see the world through the theories. And the theories told them that that was an impossibility, that an economy stuck in unemployment equilibrium was not possible. And this is where John Maynard Keynes comes into the picture. Keynes wrote a famous book in 1936 called The General Theory, in which he managed to persuade his colleagues, first, that the economy can be stuck at less than full employment, can be stuck theoretically at less than full employment, because everybody saw it in practice. And secondly, that policy can have an effect not only on the price level, but also on the real level of output, that government can, in fact, affect the real economy. Now, Keynes anchored his explanation in base instincts, something like primitive psychology. He said that in advanced capitalist societies that are relatively rich, there is a tendency of people uh, that are savers to actually save too much relative to the tendency of investors to invest too little. And that sort of base difference, base instinct difference, creates a uh, a leakage of the, out of the system that is not compensated by withdrawal, sorry, by an injection back into the system in the form of investment. So there is deficient demand that is chronic in capitalism and tends to create chronic stagnation. That's one thing. Secondly, he said that capitalism is inherently unstable. It's inherently unstable because capitalists invest, and when they invest, they base their investment decisions on their anticipation of the future. And these expectations and anticipations are based on what he called the animal spirits, on optimism and pessimism of the capitalists right now. And those bouts of optimism and pessimism tend to oscillate without any uh, real reason, and they tend to oscillate all the time. So capitalism must be inherently unstable. Keynes came and said there is a solution. The government can intervene. It can intervene by creating enough demand in the form of government spending to absorb some of those unused savings. And secondly, it can compensate the behavior of capitalists. Capitalists who uh, behave in a very unstable way can be offset by the behavior of government. So the government can both increase aggregate demand and increase economic activity as well as stabilize the economy. Uh, the figure here, figure two, uh, gives us the record of uh, the Keynesian legacy. And it seems that that record is pretty favorable to Keynes. What I show here is two growth rates. One growth rate is sorry, two series. One is the uh, growth rate of GDP, and that's the lower series relative to the left-hand 
axis, and the other is the rate of unemployment relative to the right-hand axis. So these are pretty standard measures uh, that macroeconomists look at. Now, for each series, we try to figure out how uh, had the volatility of the series changed over time. And the way we do it is as follows. We divide the entire period into two sub-periods, before 19, uh, 1945 and after 1945. And let's take the unemployment series for example. For the period up till 45, we measure the average rate of unemployment for the period, which passes more or less here. And we also compute standard deviations. A standard deviation is a measure of dispersion of a series. So we add one standard deviation above the mean or the average, and one standard deviation we subtract from the average. So we have a range of two standard deviations. Now statisticians tell us that under normal conditions, two-thirds of the variations are going to be locked between two standard deviations, above and below the average. And we do that for the subsequent period, and we do that the same thing for GDP growth. So we have a sense of the instability. And it seems that uh, Keynesian policies were incredibly successful. They were not only successful in a sense that governments seemingly were able to avert a Great Depression, but they also managed to stabilize capitalism by reducing its volatility all the way from maybe 50% uh, reduction to two-third reduction, a massive reduction in volatility between uh, the period up to the end of the war and after the war. And this may explain why in the 70s, uh, both Milton Friedman and Richard Nixon uttered the famous phrase, phrase that we are all Keynesians now. And that was uh, actually the problem. The problem was that once governments learn how to uh, monitor and control and regulate the economy, the capitalists are no longer in the driver's seat. More seriously, uh, Keynesian policy can be stuck against the capitalists by imposing all sorts of nasty taxes, for example, corporate taxes or higher personal taxes. And that is indeed uh, what had happened uh, during the period after the war. We see the share of capital and national income decline significantly as a consequence of taxation. So Keynes obviously at some point had to be undone. And this is where uh, Milton Friedman and the monetarist counter-revolution come into the picture. According to the monetarist, the pre-1930s view of the neoclassicist was right on target with two exceptions. Uh, the natural rate of unemployment and expectations. Begin with the natural rate of unemployment. The natural rate of unemployment is like the emperor's new clothes. It's only the monetarists who know exactly what it is. Nobody else can see it. Now, in order to understand what that means, go back to the period before the 1930s. Uh, the economists treated those numbers of unemployment in the sense of what you see is what you get. If the rate of unemployment is half a percent, that means the economy is doing just fine. And if the rate of unemployment is 20% in stock, that means that we are in trouble. Something in the theory is not working because the economy is stuck at a very high level of unemployment. That is not the case, say the monetarism. The monetarist appearances can be very deceiving. It's not what you see is what you get. In fact, most unemployment, they started to argue, is not unemployment at all. We live in a dynamic capitalist economy, and that means that the economy is constantly changing. There are new products, there are new sectors, there are new industries. Things are constantly in a flux. Flux creates friction, and some people get caught in the friction and they're temporarily unemployed because of that friction. But friction here is good. You want to have friction because you want to have change. Furthermore, a lot of people who are unemployed are simply taking a break. They are searching for new jobs. What does that mean? It means that they have jobs that they want to replace with better jobs. So search unemployment is not unemployment at all. 
Uh, frictional unemployment is not unemployment at all. It's part of the natural rate of unemployment. And things that are natural and desirable are things that government should not try to fix. Take your hands off. Now, can government reduce unemployment below its natural rate? Sure it can. But it can do so only by cheating. In an ideal world where everybody is rational and information is available to everyone, the government can do nothing but affect only the price level. Any intervention, any demand management will only change the price level. Unfortunately, the real world is not such. In the real world, not everybody is fully rational and information is not necessarily fully available. So under those circumstances, the government is always facing the huge temptation to cheat us for or against our own good. In other words, to cheat us in order to reduce our unemployment below its natural rate, which is not a good thing, but for some reason the government wants to do it. Now, in Friedman's, uh, sorry, uh, the efficacy of cheating depends on expectations. In Friedman, economic agents have adaptive expectations. They learn the reality only slowly. So they don't have the full picture. They, only, they always have the picture of what existed until now, not what exists right now. They're only sl slowly learning what is going on. And that means you can cheat them. And you can reduce unemployment below its natural rate. But you cannot do so for long because eventually the agents learn. And once they learn, we get hit by massive inflation as opposed to lower unemployment. Then come two other famous economists, Lucas and Sargent, and they invent the concept of rational expectation as opposed to adaptive expectation. Rational expectation means that agents have exactly the correct expectations and therefore the government can never cheat them. So government policy is entirely ineffective. It can only create inflation or deflation. And then there are others such as uh, Kidlin and Prescott who argue that the business cycle is not a demand-driven phenomenon at all. It's a real phenomenon. It's driven by technology. Government policy is driven by demand management and therefore demand management is on the demand side. The real business cycle is on the real side, the supply side. They don't talk with each other. So in fact, the government can have no effect whatsoever on what happens in the economy from the perspective of real economic activity. Now, these people, Friedman, Lucas, Sargent, uh, Kidlin, Prescott, they all won the Nobel Memorial Prize in economics. And they won it for a very good reason because they managed to completely undo Keynes. And they replaced Keynes with a new dogma, the monetarist or the rational expectation dogma, and in that dogma, policy is not only ineffective, but it's entirely unnecessary because the economy is already working at its natural levels. So there's no point in intervening, both because you're ineffective and also the uh, intervention is unnecessary. Let's return to the pre-1930 position. This was the dogma in 2008. And then came the crash and the Great Recession. And the economists remain largely unfazed. I uh, wanted to cross-list one of my courses after the crisis with the Department of Economics and I was uh, confronted with a wall of refusal because the economists told me that they do things rigorously. Uh, and I said, uh, okay, uh, but you know, the crisis has not changed anything. He said, no, no, that's, it's nothing to do with the crisis. We do things rigorously. So the uh, economists uh, uh, seem to uh, be protected by a, a very uh, nice cushion of massive subsidies as well as uh, secure tenure. Theories of economics haven't changed by much, if at all, since the crisis. However, the policymakers panicked and they panicked in unison. Instead of sitting back and letting, letting the economy fix itself, they intervene and they intervene en masse, all of them together. And in the process they have broken almost every rule in their own book. So let's begin with the fiscal side. 
This figure, figure three, shows you the government budget balance as a percent of GDP. Now, if the balance is positive, it means the government is running a surplus. If it's negative, it means that it runs a deficit. And we can see that uh, from the 1980s onwards, a decline in deficits. And uh, in the early 2000s, we see the beginning of some small surpluses, uh, for example, in Germany and in the United States. Remember, this is the period of neoliberalism. Monetarists are again in the driver's seat, so everything is nice and dandy. And then comes the first downturn of the new millennium, uh, and deficits start growing again, and then the crash. The OECD saw its deficits rising to 8% of GDP in the United States, which is the bastion of neoliberalism. We see the deficits rising to 12% of GDP. So there is a massive intervention, if you like, on the part of policymakers, exactly the opposite of what they preached only a few years earlier. Now, remember, this is not Keynesianism, and it's not a return to Keynesianism. Keynesianism was about planning, and it was about very large expenditures backed by very large taxation. Here, the deficits are mostly quick and dirty form of intervention. They're about usually lowering taxes. And they hold on for only a very brief period of time because you see from 2010 onwards, governments start, start talking about austerity and being uh, forced to tighten their belts, or rather our belts. Uh, and the reason they uh, commonly quote for this necessity of quoting, of uh, tightening uh, belts and imposing austerity uh, comes with this figure. This figure, figure four, shows the government debt in the OECD as a percent of GDP. And the list on the side shows you the levels in 2012 for key countries. And you can see that from the onset of the crisis, from uh, around 2008, 9, the crisis according to the conventional creed, the debt as a percent of GDP soared by about 50%. So it is about 110%, this is government debt of GDP, compared to roughly 70% in the 2000s and comparable to about 40% in the 1970s. So governments tell us that they have to tighten their belts because their hands are tied. They're running out of fiscal ammunition. They have to borrow so heavily and they're already so much in debt, uh, this is unsustainable. The situation on the monetary front, on the front of monetary policy, is equally demoralizing. Uh, the dogma until 2008 was that governments, in this case central bankers, should follow a fixed policy rule. A policy rule means if the economy is projected to grow at 2% in the next 10 years, you print money at the rate of increase of 2% a year. This way, the amount of money and the volume of commodities grow at the same rate, so you have no inflation and no deflation on average. So that's kind of a zero inflation policy. Uh, that's a fixed monetary rule. Comes the crisis and all hell breaks loose. Central bankers appear to have abandoned uh, this uh, fixed monetary rule and they go for what came to be known as quantitative easing, uh, or in simple word, printing money. This is the monetary base in uh, the US, the EU, and Japan. The monetary base is the magnitude that governments can uh, policymakers can directly affect. And that's notes and coins in circulation. So that's what the government can actually affect directly. It can affect indirectly or claim to affect indirectly other measures of the money supply, M1, M2, and so on. But M0, the monetary base, is something the government through the central bank controls directly. Now what we see is until 2008, the EU and the United States follow policy rules. They expand their money supply at an even rate. Uh, but in 2008, they changed direction, especially the United States. The Fed prints money 
uh, at a very high rate and in a period of a few years almost quadruples the monetary base. The Europeans are a little bit more cautious because they have a memory of the great hyperinflation of the 1920s uh, and they don't want to repeat the socially destructive uh, consequences so they fine-tune. But even that is a major deviation from the idea of not fine-tuning the economy, just sticking to a policy rule. The Japanese are the latest to uh, join the bandwagon. Uh, they actually invented the concept of quantitative easing uh, around the early 2000s and abandoned it. And now they have announced that they, over the next two years or so, they are going to double the money supply uh, following the lead of the Americans. Now, the interesting thing about all this uh, monetary policy is that it seemed to have had uh, no effect. Uh, if you uh, look at the nominal side, the deep crisis from a Keynesian perspective should have produced deflation, but it did not. From a monetary perspective, quadrupling the money supply should have generated hyperinflation, but we see none. In fact, if you look at the OECD countries over the past decade, core inflation, which is inflation with the exclusion of energy and food, which are very volatile items, has oscillated between 1% and 2%. It remained very stable. So the monetary side seemed to uh, have behaved uh, quite bizarrely, uh, you know, a, a reason for why we are flying blind. They don't understand what is going on. Now, uh, the real effect of monetary policy is also very disappointing. From a Keynesian perspective, the idea is if you print a lot of money, you reduce the rate of interest. Capitalists who have money for free, interest rate very, very cheap, have an incentive to borrow in order to invest. If you invest at an expected rate of 5% and the rate of interest is 5%, it makes no sense to borrow in order to invest to get the same rate of return. But if the rate of interest drops to 2%, there's a difference. It makes sense to borrow cheap, invest in order to gain more. But this hasn't worked. If we look at the share of investment in GDP in the OECD countries, uh, it is currently the lowest it has been since the 1970s. In 1970s, it was about 25% of GDP, and now it is 18%. It has go been going down continuously. And it's not very surprising, and it is indeed surprising, why Keynesians would expect anything else if you look at the next chart. The next chart shows you long-term government bond yields. These are interest rates computed on government bonds. And going into the quantitative easing, you can already see that interest rates are very low. Now, interest rates cannot go below zero. So at a certain point in time, if interest rates are approaching zero and the central bank prints money, that has no effect. Keynes call it pushing on a string. You know, have a string and try to push it. It doesn't really work. So it's very bizarre that anybody would expect monetary policy to revive investment. So if you take all of these observations together, you might start to understand why capitalists feel bereft of an intellectual compass and why uh, policymakers feel that they are flying blind when steering their economies. Not only have they abandoned their dogma, not only have they uh, fail to achieve their policy goals, but now they feel that they have no more policy ammunition. They've run out of fiscal tools, they are running out of monetary tools. If there is a new crisis now, they are empty-handed. There's nothing they, that they can do to actually avert a very serious crisis. So that is the situation of the dogma from the mainstream perspective. Somebody is uh, sitting uh, back to the thank you let's look at the Marxist perspective on the crisis shift from uh, the mainstream to the heterodox the question that the Marxist asks is very different they're not concerned with how to bring about a recovery they are interested in whether a sustained recovery is possible in the first place. And the general answer is no, it is not possible. 
And the reason for that answer is quite simple if you go to the uh, basic principles of Marxism. Accumulation in Marx is based on exploitation, capitalists exploiting workers. And that means that there is a struggle that lies just at the root of accumulation, a struggle between capitalists and workers. And that struggle is bound to create instability. Uh, it's bound to bring repeated crises and eventually, uh, so the hopeful hope, uh, also the breakdown of the capitalist system itself. Now, Marx did not offer us a coherent theory of crisis. But uh, it did uh, generate a number of very important principles. And these principles in due course after his death led to the uh, creation of a quite uh, voluminous uh, literature on crisis, Marxist theories of crisis. Of course, we cannot do justice to these theories here, but what we can do is perhaps highlight some of the insights and examine some of the difficulties that might be associate, associated with uh, using those theories to explain uh, what is going on recently. I will examine three uh, important theories. The first is the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. The second is the theory of the reserve army of the unemployed. And the third one is the theory of underconsumption. So begin with the uh, tendency of the rate of profit to fall. According to Marx, if we take capitalists as a class, they can only invest what they earn in profit. So the rate of profit, the rate at which profit grows, gives us the maximum rate at which accumulation can proceed because accumulation can only be the reinvestment of profit. Now Marx argues that there is a tendency, a built-in tendency in capitalism for the rate of profit to decline over time. And since the rate of profit determines the rate of accumulation, there must be also a tendency of the rate of accumulation to decline and therefore for capitalists to encounter repeated and deeper and deeper crises because the entire system is based on accumulation and it is declining. In order to understand that logic, uh, we have to go through some very basic Marxist accounting and I see some faces here that probably know Marxist accounting better than I do, so I'm encouraged. Uh, and uh, for those of you who have not encountered Marxist accounting before, uh, we just will go through a very brief crash course and you will know everything you need to know to begin. So we'll begin with the three first equations, uh, C, V, and S. These are just definitions. C is constant capital. It's the value of produced goods and services, value in terms of labor time. And that's uh, constant capital because these are already measured in dead units of labor. V is variable capital is the value of labor power. It's equivalent to what workers receive. And S is the surplus value, is the value that is left in the hands of the capitalists after they exploit the workers. Now Marx uses these three concepts, C, V, and S, which are all measured in units of socially necessary abstract labor time to compute th three uh, separate ratios. One is the organic composition of capital. It's a measure of mechanization, and that's the ratio of C to V. The other is the rate of surplus value, which is the extent to which capitalists exploit workers. So that's the ratio of the surplus value of the, work of the capitalists relative to the uh, value of labor power. And the third one is the rate of profit, which is the amount that capitalists get in surplus relative to what they invest, which is the C plus V. Now, the last equation puts everything together. If you look at the rate of profit, the rate of profit is S over C plus V. If you divide the numerator and the denominator by the same magnitude, in this case V, the equality stands. So you have on top S over V, which is the rate of surplus value, and in the bottom you have C plus V plus one, which is the organic composition plus one. So what Marx is telling us, these three ratios are all mathematically related. Capitalists will increase their profit if they exploit workers more, so if the rate of exploitation rises, 
they will reduce the rate of profit if they mechanize their production more by increasing its organic composition. So there are two opposite processes going on having the opposite effect on the rate of profit. <coughs> now what Marx is saying is that capitalists are compelled by competition to constantly mechanize their production. Mechanization is a way of cheapening commodities and the process of competition is ruthless and if you don't mechanize then you're left out. So capitalists constantly try to be more mechanized, in other words increase the ratio of C uh, of uh, if C to V. They also try to increase the rate of exploitation. Now he argues, for reasons that I cannot get into, that over the long haul, not in every moment in time, but over the long haul, the imperative to increase the organic composition tends to be stronger than the ability of capitalists to actually increase the rate of exploitation. So the denominator tends to rise faster than the numerator. So if you have a ratio and what is on, in the bottom grows faster than what is on the top, the ratio itself is going to decline. So as a consequence of these two historical processes, the rate of profit will decline over time. And that means that there is a built-in tendency in capitalism for accumulation to decelerate over time. And that's the fundamental crisis tendency of capitalism. Now there are many problems with this approach which uh, political economists, especially Marxists, have broke their head on for more than a century now. <coughs> and if you're interested, uh, we've written quite extensively on that in our book, so uh, a good introduction to that might be uh, chapters 6 and 7 in our book, uh, Capitalist Power. Here I'm just going to outline uh, three problems and uh, perhaps assess the significance um, shortly. The first problem is that all of these equations here, 1 to 7, are all denominated in labor values. They're all de denominated in socially necessary abstract labor time. To the best of my knowledge, no Marxist has ever been able to uh, measure those things independently of prices. So unless we can enumerate these equations in something we can measure, these equations are not operational. So that's the first problem. The second problem is that Marx speaks about mechanization and he equates that mechanization with the rising organic composition of capital. But that's not necessarily true. You can mechanize, but by growing mechanization, make it cheaper to actually produce machines and structures. In which case, C can actually decline because of mechanization. So growing mechanization is not synonymous with rising organic composition of capital. There could be, because of technical change, continuous devaluation of that ratio. So there's no necessity for the organic composition to rise and therefore no necessity for the rate of profit to fall. And thirdly, and equally importantly, all of these equations pertain only to productive activity and that is something very important in Marxism because economic activity is divided in general into two types. One is productive in the sense that it produces surplus value and the other is unproductive in the sense that it does not produce surplus value. Whatever does not produce surplus value consumes surplus value. So where we put the line is quite important. If we put the line in the wrong place, the whole calculus is going to be very, very different. Let me illustrate the consequence of some of these problems uh, when we come to empirical analysis. <coughs> Figure 7 tries to compare the rate of profit with the organic composition. Now because we cannot measure any of these rates using socially ne necessary labor time, we do what all Marxists do. We take actual prices and we pretend that these actual prices, as reported by the neoclassical authorities sitting in the uh, national accounting offices, uh, we pretend that they are proportionate to labor values. So we violate our assumption immediately by looking at prices rather than values. But let's for argument's sake assume that values and prices are proportionate. We also assume, contrary to what Marxists do, that all sectors in the economy are actually productive. That's not the assumptions that Marxists make, but just to illustrate the consequences. So everything 
that is happening in the economy uh, involves productive activity that produces surplus value. Now, we then compute the rate of profit in the organic composition. The rate of profit is net operating surplus, which is the uh, net domestic product less the compensation of employees. Everything else is surplus value. And we divide that by C plus V, which is the dollar value of all fixed assets, which we assume proportionate to its labor value, and the dollar value of labor income, which we assume propor is proportionate to the value of labor power. So that will be the rate of profit a la Marx. And the organic composition is the dollar value of fixed assets divided by labor income. Now, <coughs> what we see is something quite interesting. In the short term, we see uh, consistently with Marx that the two series seem to be inversely related. And that's to be expected because you see uh, fixed assets appear in the denominator in the uh, first series and in the numerator in the other series. So if you put one in the denominator, one in the numerator, obviously any change here will have the opposite effect in the other series. So that's to be expected. Uh, we also see something interesting that the latest crisis is involving a rising organic composition and therefore a declining rate of profit. So that's consistent with Marx. What is not consistent is the following. The rate of profit tends to fall, as you can see. But in Marx, the tendency of the rate of profit to fall is supposed to be associated with the rising organic composition. And what we see here is that the organic composition actually tend, trends down, not up. So there is a big anomaly here. Of course, a Marxist would say, wait a minute. You are using the assumption that every activity is productive, and obviously it's not. So let's agree that we're not doing the right thing here. Let's move and try to imitate what the Marxists do and concentrate only on productive activity. <coughs> so that was a naive case. This is a more nuanced or refined case. Now, Marxists did not, in fact, choose and separate productive from unproductive activity. Because within every firm, there could be some productive and some unproductive activity and so on. They cannot do that and they do not do that. Instead, what they do is let's say and let's isolate it, some sectors that we think are productive and separate them from the sectors that are unproductive. So this is a shortcut. And usually they would take uh, four sectors, manufacturing, agriculture, construction, and mining as productive sectors. They also enumerate utilities as productive sector, but utilities have some data problems in the United States, so therefore it is usually dropped out, and they're sticking with those four sectors, and take everything else to be unproductive. So we follow that logic here. We still assume prices are equal to value, and we compute the rate of profit. So the rate of profit is the super, sorry, surplus value. What is the surplus value? The surplus value is the total domestic net product less the wages only in the productive sector. Everything else, aside from the wages in the productive sector, is surplus value. And then we measure the capital as the productive assets plus the productive wages. So these are the assets and wages only in the four productive sectors. In the organic composition, we take only the assets of the productive sector divided by the wages in the productive sector. So we have the same analysis, but now using a separation between productive and unproductive sectors. Now again, we see in the short term, at least in the beginning, inverse correlation, which is something you would expect given that the numerators and the denominators here are uh, containing the same uh, variable. But in the long term, there is again a problem. Now we see the organic composition rising, but the rate of profit, instead of falling, is rising as well. So that doesn't sit well with uh, this theory either. So let's leave the tendency of uh, the rate of profit to fall. And of course, Marxists can always find the solution for that. The problem is that that solution is, uh, tends to be calibrated by its result. Because we don't know what is productive and what is not productive, we tend to choose those classifications that actually are consistent with what we're doing. Uh, but that's not the right thing to do. We first have to specify clearly what is productive, what is not productive. All right, let's move to the uh, reserve army 
of the unemployed. <coughs> in Marx, the rate of unemployment and the body of the unemployed people, what he called the reserve army of the unemployed, is a regulatory mechanism. The purpose of that reserve army from the viewpoint of capitalism as a whole is to make sure that workers receive a wage that is no higher than their labor value. If for some reason towards, say, the boom, uh, workers uh, are raising their heads in some sense uh, because of competition for labor, their wages rise above their subsistence, capitalists are going to feel the squeeze. They are going to cut back. As recession sets in, wages decline back to the subsistence level. So the Reserve Army is the regulatory mechanism ascertaining that workers receive an income proportionate to their value. Now, let's try to assess whether this kind of mechanism is at work in the United States over the, over the past century. And this is the next chart. This figure is a little tricky, so I need to explain it. Uh, on the right-hand scale, we show the rate of unemployment expressed as a share of the labor force. And uh, we use a log scale here. And on the left-hand scale, we show the rate of growth of the real wage. So we first compute the real wage, and then we compute the rate at which that rate changes from one year to the other. Both series, by the way, are expressed as, sorry, this uh, generates this window every time. Uh, both series are smooth as five-year moving averages to uh, make it easier for us to uh, see the movement. Now, what I, we have done here is invert the scale for the real wage rate of change. So instead of going from low numbers to high numbers, it goes from low numbers to high numbers. It's inverted. So if the real wage in the graph goes down, it means that it's actually coming up. If you read the uh, numbers on the left, you see that moving down is, in fact, raising the growth rate of the wage rate. And the reason is because, in principle, these two things are supposed to be correlated inversely. So in order to see the correlation, I invert one of the series, and then you see a positive correlation. So every positive correlation, in fact, indicates negative correlation. A perfect positive correlation will be, in fact, a perfect uh, negative correlation. Now, that's very interesting because we see, in fact, that the wage rate, the rate of change of the wage rate, and the unemployment rate are almost perfectly negatively correlated. So every time unemployment increases, the rate of increase of the wage rate goes down. And look what happened in the run-up for the current crisis. Unemployment has declined significantly, and the rate of increase of the real wage, in fact, increased dramatically. You see it declined here, but that means an increase. So this crisis could be some sort of a built-in mechanism in capitalism to get rid of those increases. There's a crisis, unemployment increases, and the rate of increase of the real wage goes down. So workers now are paying the price for the crisis by seeing the rate of growth of the real wage declining. Now, of course, this is not exactly what Marx is talking about. Marx is not talking about the rate of change of the real wages. Marx is talking about the level of the real wages. And when you look at levels, the picture is quite different. This is the next chart, figure 10. So here we still have the unemployment rate against the right-hand scale, still logarithmic. And we have two series for the real wage, this time not the rate of change of the real wage, but the level of the real wage. Now we should expect to see something similar to what happened up until the early 40s. When unemployment is declining, the real wage is rising. When unemployment is rising, the real wage is declining. So up until 1945, it seems as if Marx's argument on the role of the reserve army actually works. But from that point onwards, it breaks down. Unemployment is rising over time up until the 1990s. And the real wage, instead of declining is rising with it. And when unemployment levels off, the real wage, instead of soaring, levels off with it. 
So it seems that the real wage behaves in a way quite independently of the reserve army of the unemployed. So that theory as well, unless we uh, engineer it quite a bit, seems, at least on the face of it, quite problematic to explain what is going on. Now let's move to the third theory, the theory of underconsumption. Now a little bit about the logic of that theory first. Up until now, when we treat the uh, rising tendency of the rate of profit, sorry, the falling tendency of the rate of profit, uh, we speak about the limits on the production of surplus value. But there is another way of thinking about crisis tendencies by looking at the limits on the realization of surplus value, to actually be able to realize the surplus value that can be produced. And this is where theories of underconsumption uh, come into the fore. And the principle of underconsumption, the gist of it, is pretty straightforward. Workers consume pretty much all of their income. Most of you probably know it full well. Uh, and even if they save some of their income, most of that saving is for the purpose of consuming that income at some point later in life. That's not the case for capitalists. Capitalists have a large enough income, especially if they are big capitalists, to uh, save much of it. And in fact, more importantly, they are compelled by the social function as capitalists to save it because they need to invest. So the proportion of consumption for workers out of their income is about one but for capitalists it's less than one. And that means that if we redistribute income from capitalists, sorry, from workers to capitalists, we will see the proportion of consumption in national income declining. As income moves upward from workers to capitalists, the share of consumption in national income will decline because it moves from people who, con who save nothing to people who save something and possibly a lot. Now, that means underconsumption, not enough consumption. Underconsumption creates a glut. Glut means falling prices. Falling prices mean falling profits. Falling profits mean that capitalists scale back their investment. And then we have a generalized realization crisis. Now, up until the early 20th century, most Marxists were uh, not particularly enthusiastic about underconsumption theories at least in part because Marx was ambivalent about underconsumption. But changes towards the latter part of the 19th century and during the early part of the 20th century changed that sentiment. So we have the burst of imperialism, we have the massive Great Depression, and we have the boom that came with the Second World War. That changed the perspective. The book by John Hobson on imperialism showed the significance of underconsumption and influenced a lot of Marxists. And then John Maynard Keynes' notion of deficient demand also further amplified uh, the perspective of Marxists that were interested in underconsumption. So a new literature emerged, a literature about underconsumption. One of the key contributors to this literature was Michael Kaletsky. Kaletsky was a, a Polish political economist who uh, wrote in the 1930s. And he was a very innovative thinker. He developed uh, a so-called micro-macro economic model that uh, in many ways anticipated Keynes before uh, Keynes developed the general theory and in other senses exceeded Keynes's model. And what uh, Kaletsky was trying to do is to say we need to take account of the structure of the market in modern capitalism and how the structure of the market affects distribution and therefore affects underconsumption and therefore aggregate demand. Modern capitalism, he said, is oligopolistic. So it's characterized by very large units that operate in markets. And it therefore is associated with a high degree of monopoly, what he called. The degree of monopoly he approximated or measured by the share of capitalists in national income. And if the degree of monopoly increases, then it means that the share of capitalists in national income increases. That means a reduction in the share of consumption in national income, therefore underconsumption and a crisis of underconsumption. So in this way, Kaletsky brought the structure of the market into macroeconomic analysis. And that gave an enormous push to the school that some of you might be familiar with, and that's the school of monopoly capital. 
So Brown and Sweezy and the Monthly Review Press and so on, they developed this argument uh, to its fullest. Now what I want to do now is try to generalize Kaletsky. And uh, say Kaletsky is talking about the division of income between capitalists and workers. Let's think not about capitalists and workers, but let's th think about the size distribution of income. Those who earn less, those who earn more, and so on, all the way to those who earn the most. So that will be the distribution of income, regardless of the source of the income, whether it comes from labor or from capital. And see how that might affect economic performance. Because, in fact, as you have more income, you are likely to consume less of it. So that's a generalized argument that is advanced by Kaletsky. Now what I do in this uh, chart, what, what uh, we present in this chart, is on the bottom, the income share of the top 1% of the population. Again, the, both of the data series are smooth as 10-year moving averages. <coughs> So as you can see, uh, this pattern uh, starts with an increase in the income share, a decline, and a subsequent increase. The, bot the top part of the series shows you the rate of growth of employment, annual rate of growth of employment. That's a proxy for economic performance. One can use overall economic growth, but economic growth is made of two com components, the growth of employment times the growth of productivity. And productivity is not directly related to underconsumption. So it's better to leave it out and look only at employment growth. And as you can see, the correlation is clearly negative, as Kaletsky would, uh, anticipate it, would have anticipated. We see up until the 1930s, the Gilded Age. So inequality rises and employment growth declines. Then comes uh, the period of the uh, Keynesian welfare warfare state and we see inequality declines and employment growth soaring. We see also a massive increase coming with the Second World War and then the period of demobilization which of course are unrelated to the distribution of income. Uh, but we do see a clear uptrend associated with the period of Keynesianism. From the 1980s onwards, we see the emergence of monetarism, neoliberalism, and of course, a massive increase in inequality. And as a consequence of that, possibly, a decrease in employment growth. Uh, notice that the magnitudes in the beginning of the 2010 are very uh, close to the magnitudes uh, during the onset of the Great Depression. Now, this is of course quite consistent with the view of the monopoly capitalist school all the way back to Kaletsky. And uh, from the perspective of the underconsumptionist, the future is either a massive change in the distribution of income, which will enable possibly a regeneration of growth, or if there is no change because of inherent limitations on the market structure, the power of capitalists, and so on, then uh, we are in for a very rough ride. Now, up until this point, I was talking about crisis from the viewpoint of mainstream uh, political economy and Marxist political economy, uh, but I did not uh, define what a crisis was. From the conventional view, both heterodox and mainstream, the engine of capitalism is the economy. And the twin elements in that agent, the twin pistons, if you like, is accumulation and economic growth. Accumulation brings about economic growth, and economic growth is the fuel that sustains accumulation. And both of them are measured in real terms. Now, from this perspective, the next chart uh, shows you the rate, uh, I'm looking only at the top part of the chart, uh, but I will have to lower it so you can see the dates. So the thick line shows you the rate of growth of fixed assets, again measured in dollar terms, uh, but expressed in real terms, so deflated by uh, the GDP, appropriate GDP deflator, and the rate of growth of GDP. So from a Marxist or mainstream economic perspective, these are the twin engines. Accumulation breeds growth, 
growth, growth breeds accumulation. And what we see here is something quite consistent with the Marxist view. You can argue that uh, capitalism is uh, conflict ridden and that conflict generates uh, deceleration of accumulation and a deceleration of growth all the way from the 1950s and 60s that culminates now with this massive crisis that we are in. However, when we think uh, about the interest of capitalists and workers, the material interests, because they are driven by the desire to accumulate more in real terms or earn more in real terms in terms of wages and salaries, they are both on the same side of the fence. If you look at the next chart, the next chart shows you real GDP, capitalist income and labor income, all expressed in real terms and uh, measured in terms of rate of change. So if you look at the bottom, these series are smooth. <laughs> you can't see that. Uh, so we can see that the fluctuations of real GDP, real profit, and real wages are all moving in tandem. What that means, in simple words, is that capitalists and workers both love recovery. They love growth because their incomes are rising, and therefore accumulation is rising or wages are rising. So capitalists are work and workers, despite the possible conflict between them, as far as the economy is concerned, are both interested in the same thing. They're interested in economic growth. Uh, and in that sense, mainstream and Marxist, Marxian economies are, economists are also sitting on the same side of the fence. Now, of course, they differ in a sense that for neoclassical economists, uh, a crisis comes from distortions in the economy. Uh, whereas for Marxists, it is built in the structure of the economy. And they have different solutions and so on. But the definition of the crisis is the same. It's a decline in economic growth and decline in real accumulation. Now, here we come finally to the capitalist power perspective. And from a capitalist power perspective, the understanding of the accumulation process is completely different and therefore the understanding of crisis is completely different. Whereas for the economist, uh, capital is an economic entity. We think of capital as a power institution. We think therefore of crisis not as something that has to do with production and consumption as such, but something to do with capitalized power. When we see crisis, we're talking about a crisis of capitalized power. Now, what is capitalized power? Or what is capitalist power more generally? Again, uh, we have to be very brief here. But in essence, we can go back to Johann Kepler, who in 1600 suggested that we need to shift our understanding of power altogether and force altogether and think instead of them as qualitative entities in their own right as being quantitative relationships between entities. So power is a relationship and it's a quantitative thing. And if you uh, impose that logic on capitalism, we can say that capitalized power is a quantitative relationship. A quantitative relationship that is measured by the distribution of income and assets between capitalists and other classes in society, as well as between capitalists themselves. And from that perspective, understanding the grid of distribution as a measure of power, we developed in the late 1990s some sort of a sense of what a regime, a successful regime of accumulation means. And we said two things. A, for a regime of accumulation to exist, differential accumulation, the rate at which dominant capital the large state-backed state coalitions at the center of the political economy have to accumulate relative to the average. They have to grow relative to the average. So that's positive or at least non-negative differential accumulation is a necessary condition. Secondly, the overall share of capital in national income has to either remain stable or increase. The first condition is necessary because that is the manifestation of the drive to power of capitalists and is also 
an indication of the ability to reorder the political economy, to control the political economy. The second condition is necessary to ascertain the capitalist nature of the society because if the share of capitalist and national income declines, eventually the economy or sorry, the society is going to become non-capitalistic. A crisis under those circumstances is a violation of these conditions. So if differential accumulation breaks down or the share of capital and national income declines, this is when we have a crisis. So we plotted uh, both of these series in order to assess the validity of these conditions. All right, uh, th this chart was first drawn uh, in a different way. Uh, in 1988 and since then we have been updating and refining it. Uh, the top part of the chart shows you the second condition. It shows you the share of capitalist in national income uh, and that's pre-tax profit and net interest or what economists call EBIT. EBIT stands for earnings before in interest and taxes. And you can see that this ratio has been trending upwards. So if in the 1930s uh, capitalists have grossed about 12% of the domestic uh, product in uh, the period recently. They uh, came up with about 16%. So that's about one-third increase over the entire period. You can also see by the dotted lines that bound this uh, series that the v volatility of that series is declining. And if volatility is some measure of risk, the conclusion is that uh, capitalists are not only gaining in power, but they are also seeing that power becoming less volatile, less risky. Uh, the second series shows you differential accumulation. It shows you the ratio of pre-tax profit and uh, net interest per firm among the largest dominant capital firms to the average. What we have done here is to take all firms in the uh, political economy, rank them from the largest to the smallest, take the top 200, and compute the average EBIT for the top 200 firm, the average earnings before interest and taxes, and we have done the same for all firms. And then we divide the top average by the overall average, and that's a measure of differential accumulation. Now, we can see that the dominant capital firm in the 1950s was about 900 times bigger than the average. Uh, by the 2000, the number is about 14,000. So the increase has been tremendous, about 4.5% increase year in and year out. Now, if you look at these two uh, figures, and uh, I will have to change something here so you can see... Uh, yeah, you're limiting my own time, eh? If you are looking at these two pictures, what you see is if you think of uh, capital as an economic entity and accumulation as an economic process, you see a decline over time. If you think about it as a power process, you see an increase. So there is a fundamental difference between the economic approach and the power approach to uh, accumulation and to capitalism more generally. Now, let's look at differential accumulation at the series at the bottom. Uh, we see that overall the tendency is up, but there are two major crises, one in the early uh, 1980s and the other in the late 2000. Uh, the series is plotted against a log scale, so it's hard to be impressed by the visual declines here, but they're quite significant. Uh, in uh, the early 1980s, the decline was about 20%, and in the late 19, uh, 2000, it was about 30%. Uh, of course, there was a massive resumption here because this is neoliberalism uh, and uh, Reagan in power and monetarism, all, all of that. But here we have a significant decline. Now, there's a big difference between the first and the second crisis. During the first crisis, the overall share of capital was still rising. So only one of those conditions was broken. Uh, during the uh, late 2000, the differential accumulation went into negative territory and the overall share of capital and national income was declining as well. So this is a more serious crisis. Uh, 
Now looking ahead, in order for capitalists to continue and raise these two indicators, uh, this is going to become increasingly difficult. Let's begin with differential accumulation. Differential accumulation now is about three times bigger than it was in the 80s. To continue and augment differential accumulation at the same pace means that mergers and acquisitions ha will have to continue and uh, occur at the same rate that they did in the 1980s and 90s, which is not very likely, given the enormous size of firms right now, or that large firms are going to be able to increase their differential profit margins relative to the average tremendously. Again, very difficult to, to conceive given the already very high margins that they enjoy. So capitalists are facing a serious challenge looking ahead. Let's look at the challenge of expanding the share of capital and national income. And here we come to the last two figures of the presentation. So Joe is going to be happy. These figures will be quite counterintuitive uh, to most of you. If you look at the top, you can see the unemployment rate uh, against the right-hand scale, but it's plotted with a lag of three years. So every observation is the rate of unemployment three years earlier. By the way, these data are smooth again as five-year moving averages. So every observation for unemployment is what happened three years earlier. Now, from a conventional perspective, we would expect unemployment to do harm to capitalists most of the time. High unemployment means lower growth and means that capitalists are not going to do very well. But we see here the exact opposite. We see the share of capital in national income, pre-tax profit and net interest actually being very tightly correlated with the rate of unemployment three years earlier. If you look at the bottom, you see the rate of change of the two series, and you see the massive, the, the very highly tight correlation between the two series. They are positively correlated rather than negatively correlation, correlated. That means, in very simple words, that capitalists do not love recovery, they don't love prosperity, they actually love crisis. The same picture, plotted somehow differently, is offered by the next graph and the last in your handout. This graph, instead of plotting the two series against time, plots them against each other. So we have the unemployment rate three years earlier on the horizontal axis and the share of capitalists in national income against the vertical axis. Now, if you look at the relationship, it is extremely tight and positive. The R square, which is a measure of the explanatory power of this relationship, is 82%, which means that unemployment explains 82% of the variations in the capitalist share of national income in a positive way, not in a negative way. And the slope of the line that goes through those observations is 0 0.8. What it means, again, in simple words, is that 1% increase in unemployment would lead three years la la later to a 0.8% incre increase in the share of capitalists in national income. Now again, this is counterintuitive. We would expect unemployment to be the curse of capitalists. They don't like unemployment. They like actually a booming economy. Now Marx was prescient to say unemployment plays a role through the reserve army of the unemployed, but usually only towards the peak of the cycle. In general, capitalists over a long period of time do not want to see unemployment. So you can say the short-term fluctuations maybe make sense, but the long-term association? That makes absolutely no sense. Capitalists should hate it. But in fact, they love it. If you look at this situation, the best situation for them is actually an unemployment rate of about 8 or 9%. This is where the share of national income is the highest. Now, from a perspective of capitalist power, all of this makes quite a lot of sense because the driving force here is not the economy, it's power relations. And in order to accumulate cap uh, capital as power, you have to inflict sabotage. And 
We have spent about 20 or 30 years investigating different forms of sabotage and in this room there are uh, quite a lot of students who expand and extend this inquiry into new and exciting fields and I uh, welcome all of you for subsequent, two subsequent presentations in this series about this subject. But what we can see here is that unemployment is still a key form of sabotage, not only in the short run but in the long run as well. Now the policy implications, and I'm uh, going to finish in a couple of minutes, are quite uh, significant. Not only have capitalists abandoned the dogma, uh, at least through their policy makers, not only have the policy makers uh, run out of ammunition, policy ammunition, but the goal of policy seems to be contradictory. If policy makers are to cater to the capitalist, allowing for greater accumulation and in so doing, propping up the economy and the economy then propping up capitalist accumulation and so on, that could be inconsistent according to these data with the interest of capitalists. Because if policymakers manage to prop up the economy, they are going to cause the share of capital and national income to decline. So capitalists are not interested, at least from that perspective, in prosperity, they are not keen on having a recovery, they are quite happy, although they might not admit it, with the status quo of a significant crisis. Now what lies ahead is an interesting question. You see, we are here now and we know that over the past few years, remember these are lagged series, Unemployment has increased dramatically. If the relationship depicted here continues to hold, it means we're going to see a significant increase in the share of capital in national income in the years to come, in the few years to come. But capitalists are looking forward. In order to increase further their share of national income, and they're continuously driven to do it, they have to try to do it, they have to inflict more damage and more sabotage and more unemployment. And that could become explosive. And this is why they are torn. They have a serious dilemma. They need a crisis and they fear a crisis at the same time. And this is where the systemic crisis and the systemic fear, in fact, comes from. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, you covered so much ground there. So I expect there are some audience members who would like you to retrace your steps. And I'm also hoping that uh, some audience members would like to engage you on some contested territory. Uh, with that in mind, I'd like um, our technical team to take uh, the mics. Who's uh, volunteering to do that? And uh, could I implore the audience members to actually speak directly in the mic so um, your questions are recorded for posterity? Uh, Jonathan. Uh so my question is specifically about this graph, which I think is fascinating. I wonder if you could talk about the three-year delay, because um, that's quite interesting to me. I, I was thinking about, you know, on a firm level, uh, and I, the firm that came to mind was BlackBerry. You know, its, it's profits fall and it fires workers in response to that. But on aggregate, Obviously, you're, you've shown that unemployment is correlated with an increase in the capitalist sh share of income. I don't know if you could maybe explain that dynamic a little bit more clearly and the significance of the time lag, or what you think of the time lag. Let me first say that uh, I don't have a good answer to this question. Uh, you can think uh, in a political economy in which workers have uh, some contracts that is going to take time uh, before unemployment has an impact on the wage rate because those wage rates take time to expire to be renewed and so on. So there could be an impact, a delayed impact on the wage rate. I think it's much more complicated than that. I think it has a lot to do with the other sectors that we don't think about it and that's the sector of unincorporated businesses which are not immediately coming to mind when we think we think of capital versus labor, but there's a large sector of unincorporated businesses that actually uh, behave quite uh, in an interesting way relative to unemployment that can explain some of this lag delay. But I, uh, 
don't have uh, a persuasive answer, not persuasive to you, uh, but not even persuasive to me, this is something that we are still working on. So uh, it's always nice to have uh, some enigma uh, to uh, entice us to do more research. I know uh, it's nicer to have answers, but uh, I cannot claim to have one. By the way, uh, just kind of uh, a follow-up on that. If you remove the three-year delay, you still have a long-term positive correlation, a pretty tight long-term positive correlation, but you don't have a short-term positive correlation. And the, the, the interesting correlation, in, in my opinion, is the long-term. The short-term is kind of a freebie. Uh, the interesting aspect is that in the long-term, capitalists actually benefit distributionally from, from unemployment. But I don't have uh, a definitive answer to your question. We're still thinking about it and researching it. Other questions, comments? Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, about the mechanism of sabotage and how uh, that uh, functions as a workaround to the, the asymptotic limits of of, of capital, I guess, is the question. Uh, I think your, your question is uh, too general. Maybe you want to make it uh, well, more concrete so well, I can zero yeah, in on. Sure. I, this is, this is the, the aspect that I'm particularly interested in, is, is you've described sabotage in a, in a kind of generic sense. Right. And obviously, sabotage functions in very particular, distinct ways. You know, you, you have informational sabotage, physical destructive sabotage, uh, ecological sabotage. So where, which, which kind of vector of those is, is most pertinent? And how does, it, how does it function to allow one or another um, assemblage within capital to rise above, above others? Well, you can think about sabotage at the aggregate level. So, for example, unemployment here is uh, used to describe an aggregate form of sabotage. It's not necessarily something that every particular capitalist is uh, contemplating, but uh, as a class, it's certainly something that capitalists think about. Uh, you can think of uh, more individual form of sabotage, for example, intellectual property rights, uh, would be a clear form of sabotage. A large chunk of all capitalized assets are backed by intellectual property rights, and that's a pure form of sabotage. You can have more exotic forms of sabotage, for example, uh, militarized conflict. Uh, we have done uh, our earlier work on the Middle East, and in the Middle East, wars, what we call energy conflicts in the Middle East, uh, turn out to be a very destructive on the one hand, but incredibly profitable from a differential perspective form of sabotage for the large uh, integrated oil companies as well as armament corporations. So you can, I think, uh, think of uh, endless number of forms of sabotage and they are all uh, becoming meaningful if you can actually describe and discover some sort of a regularity that that sabotage manifest itself with respect to differential earnings. Um, so these are just, I think, three examples. I think uh, some of the uh, people, uh, the graduate students sitting here are going to talk about uh, uh, alternative forms of sabotage that we haven't investigated. For example, James McMahon, who is standing uh, next to you, is going to speak about uh, sabotage on the creativity um, in the cultural sphere. Uh, the creativity, say, in, in Hollywood and how films are made and how limitations on the scope of that creativity actually uh, are able to, these limitations, reduce risk of the uh, large media conglomerates and by doing so amplify their capitalization. That's another form. Uh, Troy Cochran is going to speak about uh, advertisement. Uh, with respect to um, you know, luxury commodities such as diamonds and how you create a mindset of limitations on the necessity of actually buying uh, diamonds. So that's a form of controlling the mind. All of these are manifestations, in my opinion, of power. And these manifestations, though, become meaningful only if you can 
clearly correlate them to differential measures of power through distribution. And if you can meaningfully uh, convince yourself and others that the capitalists involved have some sense of what they're doing. Okay. Um, based on the graph that you showed us here, sure. Uh, when you compare the rate of unemployment with uh, profit sharing, is there an optimum rate of unemployment for capitalists? And <laughs> if so, um, does it, can we project that unemployment will continue to rise and maybe lead to the fall of the system completely? All right. Uh, according to this chart, which offers uh, an incredibly tight regression by economic standards, I think, uh, the best uh, rough rate of unemployment, the natural rate of unemployment as far as capitalists are concerned about is about eight and a half percent because this is where their share of national income is the highest. Could you go higher? Possibly. Uh, but then you're testing the limits because this is, uh, to uh, follow Marx, this is a dialectical process. Obviously, the more sabotage that you inflict on society, uh, initially, the greater power you uh, ascertain for yourself as a ruling class, but at some point uh, the relationship inverts and at some point there's a backlash. And uh, rulers throughout history are, have been constantly testing the ability to push those limits. Where is the optimum level? Uh, we know of the optimum levels only in retrospect when the system breaks down. We say we pushed beyond that optimum and in history we have a lot of those pushes of optimums and then uh, they uh, manifest themselves in uh, systemic breakdowns, but I don't know what the optimum is. Only historically, in retrospect, I think we can know. And the ruling class always learns that the hard way. But right now, they are uh, in a fairly good position. They are, uh, 2012 is kind of middle ground. Uh, the uh, higher uh, extremes of that uh, relationship have been tested and uh, sustained pressure. So uh, they can push all the way for uh, you know, 8 9% unemployment with no real problem, uh, at least if this relationship stands. So we can still have quite a lot to go. Um, question in regards to statistics, Jonathan. Uh, how do you mitigate changes in um, historical statistics gathering? So in the sense, if you take 100 years of worth of statistics, we were to assume that the gathering methods themselves change. Uh, so, Yeah, you have to read the fine print. Yeah. Uh, th there is no general answer. When you do empirical work, you fall on your face so many times when uh, method of measurements change. For example, recently uh, the uh, um, the Central Bureaus of Statistics have moved towards integrating what they call hedonic regressions uh, into uh, their measurement of prices, and they moved from fixed to changing baskets and so on. I mean, these are technical terms that might seem quite boring to most of you, but if uh, you were ever to be engaging in empirical work, you have to break your head on what is the implication of uh, the changing nature of statistics and are the statistics comparable? Sometimes they're not comparable and you can sort out to what extent they're not comparable and what the uh, manifestations of this difference are and sometimes you cannot. And sometimes you don't know that the methods have changed and you draw conclusions that are patently false. So all of those things have happened to me, to us, yeah. Don't be shy. I got, I got another kind of toss off question. Sure. Wait. Is it true that you have a piece coming up in the, the most recent, uh, the, the, the journal Collapse? Uh, no, that was uh, a plan that we declined to accept. Oh, okay, fair enough. Oh. Fair enough. <laughs> Jonathan, I have a question in regard to figures 15 and 16. And I'm wondering whether the very tight correlations that you show are, to some extent, uh, 
uh, result of the variables that you've chosen. So in terms of the uh, capitalist share of domestic income, you'd expect that as unemployment rises, there are less people on payrolls, and therefore um, national income will decline. And as, as a result of that, capitalist share of national income will increase. So I was wondering whether there's an element of spuriousness in the uh, correlations that you show here. Well, distribution is what it is. So uh, the conclusion, this question was also asked uh, today uh, by one of my graduate students in a seminar. The point that we are driving here is more fundamental than that, is that capitalists, if we think about capital as power, so if capitalists are concerned with distribution for and foremost, as opposed with, to uh, the real measures of their assets, but the relative measures of their assets, then uh, they're interested in uh, ongoing stagnation. They're interested in what everybody else calls a crisis. Uh, if you take the economic perspective, that will be um, a revolting thing to say. Capitalists are interested in growth. The faster the growth, I mean, if you look at the uh, previous charts here, uh, figure 13, you can see that uh, the accumulation of so-called real capital through uh, pre-tax profits and interests are correlated with GDP, and so is the uh, accumulation of fixed assets are correlated with GDP growth. So from that perspective, they are actually interested in rapid growth. The question that I think uh, is sharpened by this presentation is what kind of an approach or what kind of a logic you impose on capitalists. If you impose on them the logic of power, then you can uh, wave bye-bye to uh, you know, any sustained recovery. They have no interest in sustained recovery. If you think about it from an economic perspective, then they are fighting nail and tooth to achieve recovery. Somehow, for some reason, they cannot achieve it. So I would uh, kind of challenge uh, you to think what might be a better explanation. Are they incapable of generating recovery, or maybe they are not interested in recovery? So that's a kind of an observation, I think, is prior to your question of what exactly is determining uh, the distribution. The explanation might be banal uh, in a sense that you know, workers are doing worse off during a recession than capitalists. We are showing it. But the point is that capitalists love recession, and therefore they uh, will uh, prevent any kind of sustained growth if they could. I think that is the message that uh, we are trying to uh, make here. Just to follow on from that, figure 14 suggests that at least dominant capital don't love crisis, insofar as that over the last four or five years, um, their differential income has plateaued? Uh, well, we need to look more carefully on what happens to uh, dominant capital. Uh, we haven't investigated sufficiently with respect to standard measures of crisis. So again, this is a question that I don't have a good answer for, and I dislike making uh, conjectures on the basis of ignorance. Hi. Um, just maybe in connection with your question. So it seems like the big difference between, or one of the differences between um, the two other models, the neoclassical and the Marxist one, and the power model, is how you view, is in a way how you view the capitalist class. and. Um, so it seems like the kind of power, especially in the Marxist model, that capitalists have is kind of a structural power. And the reason they can't change from crisis to recovery is because um, it's because even though they're trying and they're interested in growth, they can't do it because the market has a kind of automaticity and autonomy that they don't have the power to control in some ways. In your model, um, they're not interested in recovery, and their kind of their power is more agentic, so they have more agency to control. So the market is 
more under their control rather than, is that something, I don't know if I'm explaining it. I, I think that capitalists in both, from both perspectives are not interested or disinterested in recovery. They are impartial mm -hmm. to recovery or recession. What they're interested in is in accumulation. Okay. And if recovery serves the accumulation, they're all for recovery. And if it does not, then they're not. They are not really interested, and there's no reason why they should be with the plight of uh, common people. They're not interested in what is produced. Eventually, they are after accumulation. The question is, how do they view accumulation? From their perspective, if they view it uh, as we think they do, as a power process, and therefore concerned with differential accumulation if they are big and they are concerned with differential measures uh, overall, then the conclusions will be quite different than if you take a standard perspective and say they are interested in real accumulation of physical assets because they're driven by utility or by simply the desire to accumulate more things or more labor, dead labor. Uh, so at that point, you don't even need to uh, you know, go deeper into explanations, it's a, it's a question of what is the driver of the system and what capitalists feel compelled to do. It's not about their desires or their preference or anything like that. It's what the system compels them to do. And we believe they are compelled to think differentially. So uh, I think that uh, from my experience, capitalists think only in, rel in relative terms. They only think in relation to a benchmark. And when you think differentially, you are always thinking in terms of redistribution. And we view redistribution as a power process. So therefore, that enables us to theorize what capitalists do, why they do it, and how successful or unsuccessful they are. So the spectacle has to do with what drives capitalism. I don't think that capitalists are driven by anything absolute. And I don't think that they're driven by utilitarian conditions or by, by the desire to accumulate uh, dead labor. They are always driven by some sort of a differential performance. Mike. Hey, um, I just want, this is more of a clarifying question. Uh, right at the end you said that capitalists both have a need and a fear of crisis. And does that, does that kind of tie into the idea that on figure 14 you're talking about how the volatility and the risk is is decreasing, so the f though they do need it, their fear of it is actually decreasing. So they're more partial to crises actually happening again and again. Well, I would see it, uh, I think, differently. Uh, I think that if risk is declining, it means that it can only increase. So if you have very little risk, uh, the uh, downside is enormous. Uh, if uh, when, uh, when uh, Desmond Tutu expressed uh, this observation about South Africa uh, and the history of the blacks uh, and the whites, he said when uh, the whites came to South Africa, they had the Bible and we had the land. And now the situation is inverse. We have the Bible and they have the land. Uh, and the reason uh, this is significant is because the original investors basically managed to reduce risk by uh, inflicting the Bible on the uh, black population. They uh, reduced risk. They uh, force educated, conditioned uh, the indigenous population to come to work. And uh, that reduction of risk, if you buy an asset and the risk is reduced, the capitalization of the asset shoots up. So to reduce risk, is always possible when risk is very high. And James is going to tell you all about that uh, a couple of weeks from now. So I view that uh, particular chart as very ominous for capitalists. A, their share of national income is, is very high. And B, they uh, actually uh, experience very low volatility, which means that volatility can very well increase from now on. It's very hard to think of reducing this volatility even further. So they are very scared for pushing it or from pushing it further because they are afraid they are pushing against the asymptote. And after a while, this is going to go uh, down. But, th but that remains to be seen. We don't know. Only in retrospect, we know those things. I was wondering how does the volatility of the capitalist income share, um, how does it connect to the overall volatility? Is there a correlation 
side, just off the top. Uh, you mean the overall volatility that was presented uh, in an earlier figure? Yeah. Figure two. Uh, it's interesting. I don't know. I haven't checked it. I mean, we see a decline in both volatilities uh, in this general macroeconomic volatility between the pre-war and post-war period, and we see a decline in volatility uh, in the share of capitalists and national income. So in that general sense, very general sense, the volatility is down in both. But is there uh, a more intimate correlation? I have not look at, looked into it, so I don't know. I wonder if that can tell you something about the relationship between the capitalists. It's, the it, it, it requires further thinking. It's yeah. not just an empirical correlation. You have to think of what it means. And I have not thought about it, so I don't know. The question you posed is very interesting, because if you look at figure 14, uh, Jonathan uh, does show a secular reduction in volatility of the capitalist income share. But if you look closer in the post-war period, basically the two decades following the Second World War, there is a marked reduction in the volatility mm -hmm. of capitalist income share, uh, just as there is a marked reduction in volatility, volatility of the GDP during the Keynesian era um, that you show in figure two. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Sorry, is this a question? It's not a question, it's just an observation. Uh, you, you have to remember that volatility is something that you have to measure relative to the magnitude. And there's been a significant increase in the magnitude. So the variations when the average is 16, the same variations will be much smaller than when the average is only 12. So it, this is a very rough. Uh, intuitive view of volatility, we need to measure it more precisely. And it might be actually that volatility has declined significantly even after, although it might seem not to be the case here. So again, this is for further research. The food is free and the questions are free. No sabotage here. So, in, in my opinion, figure 14 uh, very clearly shows that capitalists have never been stronger. So is it a contradiction to say that capitalists have never been stronger, and yet they're so afraid um, that there's systemic fear, that they, that they don't know what's you know, coming up in the future? Because in my, in my mind, if, if they've never been stronger, then there's still plenty of room to send us back to the 19th century. By I mean, we're in the West, especially, we're still far more far richer than in the rest of the world. So there's still plenty of, of room for us to fall back to the third world or the 19th century, um, because there's hardly any organized resistance. I mean, there's only spontaneous outbursts of anti-capitalism. Hardly any organized resistance or uh, mass-based popular awareness of of capitalism and capitalist power. So I guess the first. One question is, is it a contradiction to say that they've, they've never been so powerful, and yet this gives them fear? I mean, if, if they're powerful, why would they be afraid? Uh, well, I mean, th this is a, a very good question that raises all sorts of uh, uh, research trajectories. A. Uh, this is just the United States. And of course, uh, the United States has to be situated in a global context. And the global context might change the picture altogether. Uh, secondly, uh, I, I think uh, that this picture does not articulate the limitations that are imposed on further increases in power. Because capitalists, from, at least from our perspective, are driven by the need to not maintain the power, but increase it further. And if that is correct, if that claim is correct, then they do realize that there are serious limitations to raising their power further. And this is what we tried to do in the paper we wrote on the asymptotes of power, to try to decompose the various components of profit uh, in general and profit of dominant capital in particular and see uh, in what direction can they expand their power further? And I think that what we try to indicate, in my opinion, quite successfully, is that they're quite um, 
conscientious of some of the key limitations. Now, whether uh, this fear is a real fear or whether we are imagining it remains uh, really to be seen in retrospect. So we give all sorts of indications that they're saying our dogma of understanding the world is breaking down. We see that markets are in a bear market for a decade and so on. We see all sorts of indications that some, they feel that something is wrong. We also see an indication that uh, there are some objective limits on what they can do. At the same time, you are correct in saying, look, uh, they are as powerful as they were during the 20th century, and they seem to be engaged with no significant uh, class opposition that is conscious of itself. So doesn't this uh, lead them to uh, sort of a position of hubris? Uh, in other words, we can get away with this, and we can get away with more, and so on. And that's entirely possible. But I think history tells us that these positions of hubris are kind of uh, uh, very tenuous. And uh, whether uh, this systemic crisis and systemic fear pans out to be a real one or not, I mean, I'm not going to stick my neck onto it because I am humbled by history. I'm trying to think, if I were a capitalist, what I would look at. And what I see is, yes, there's no objective opposition to me that is serious enough. But the opposition comes from the magma sometimes in a very surprising way. So occasionally, history surprises us. And I would be very worried as a capitalist, given some of the indications that I've given today, given some of the indications that I've given in previous presentations on the limits of what they can do should the next crisis hit and so on. So yes, you're right. Both are possible. It's possible that this kind of confidence that we can get away with this, we can get away with more, and so on, is ingrained by the fact that despite the crisis, they continue to do quite well. Uh, but it's possible that they are also uh, harboring uh, a very deep fear. And I don't have you know, a crystal ball. Only in retrospect will I have one. I think you're right. right. Yeah, sure. So Part, part of your evidence is anecdotal, right, on, on page Yeah, uh, that's three. entirely anecdotal, but it seems to be quite significant. I think, yeah, I mean, this was, this was certainly the case in 2008, 2009, 2010, but I think more in the past couple of years, there's been, in the Financial Times, there's been a shift. I mean, uh, uh, Gillian that, Tett, for example, interviewed Alan Greenspan just a, uh, this month or last month. Yeah, I read its article. He, he reputed half his statements from 2008, 2009. He said, you know, I, I thought it was wrong back then, but now I... That's not what I read. He said basically that the models broke down, and obviously the model of rational uh, behavior is, is really inappropriate. That's what I read a few days ago. That, uh, he said he was only half wrong. Yeah, but... Uh, you know, Alan Greenspan is not running policy anymore, and what he basically suggested is that all their models broke down. When you read the last uh, comment, they're not saying we are flying blind because their policy doesn't work. When they say we are flying blind, it means something very specific. It means their models give them the, correct, the incorrect results, that mathematical models do not operate properly, they predict the wrong thing. And without those mathematical statistical spectacles, they consider themselves blind. So for me, this is a very serious thing. Whether this is going to doom the capitalist class or not, I have no idea. I don't think anybody does. I don't think the capitalists have. But I think these kind of expressions and the limits that we are trying to uh, suggest exist are quite uh, special to this period. Again, whether this will prove the kind of the death canal, I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, I don't claim to know. I don't think anybody knows. Um, in whose interest do you think Keynesianism was? Excuse was, me? In whose interest was, uh, were Keynesian policies in? In whose interest? So if not the capitalists. So my understanding of Keynesianism is, Keynesianism is that it saved capitalism in the 30s and 40s. Uh, yeah, sh yeah, sure. In the, in the 30s and 40s, they saved capitalism from, from the possibility of socialism and uh, fascism. I, I completely agree. But... Uh, from the late 60s onwards, that was considered a done deal. And uh, at that point, uh, capitalists said, we want to basically assume the driver's seat again. And, uh, and they did. So sure, I think Keynesianism was some sort of a collective response to a very existential crisis. And it's possible that capitalists are going to uh, 
uh, be forced into some sort of an alternative. I just don't see the mindset actually taking hold, uh, something uh, akin to Keynesianism in terms of planning. Because remember, it's the 1930s and the 1940s, in other words, the crisis and the war that galvanized belief in deficient demand and then in demand management policies. And unless we have a crisis of that kind of magnitude that puts everybody in the same boat, that puts everybody uh, sort of in the same mindset, I, I don't see any pressure on capitalists to actually save themselves from their you know, own pushing of, uh, against the asymptotes. I don't see that happening. There's nothing on the radar save uh, some sort of a nuclear uh, uh, development in Japan or something like that that will require some sort of a complete rethinking of what we're doing or some sort of ecological disaster or some sort of a massive Great Depression that is going to develop to make that sort of a preemptive policy. Again, it could happen, but I don't see the mindset developing. So, yeah, it saved capitalism, but uh, capitalists do not feel that they uh, somehow uh, are not even in the mindset that they need to save themselves from themselves now. They're just worried, but uh, they go on. And again, in history, we have examples of systemic collapse that were just waiting to happen in retrospect. When you read them, they are very, very obvious. But as they were unfolding, uh, the ruling classes were not sure of what's, what's going what was happening to them? They were flying blind. I'm not very good at predictions. Unless you pay me. And then I'm willing to predict anything. Eli? Yeah, I was just going to say... If, Mike. If, I can, if Warren Buffett is saying we need to share the wealth, I mean, I'm maybe oversimplifying here a lot, but... But if he's saying we need to share the wealth, I don't think he's doing it out of, our, our, out of his, the goodness of his heart. He maybe understands something. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. So it's like the breakup of uh, Standard Oil of New Jersey uh, at the turn of the 20th century. The regulators that decided to break the Standard Oil of New Jersey said, uh, this is all nice and dandy to have those uh, guys like Rockefeller running the show, but we are risking socialism. So we need to actually do something to uh, remove, undo this excess. And I think Warren Buffett is fearing that at some point he will have to run for the hills. Uh, so it's better uh, to have less, to control less, and not run for the hills. And that's his reform, reformist mindset. And uh, maybe Soros is thinking uh, in similar lines. But most capitalists are not forced to do it at this point. Okay, well, um, given the studied silence in the room, I think it's an opportune time to end the session. I'd like to thank Jonathan for a fascinating presentation. I'd like to thank you for attending. Um, but before uh, I let you go, I just want to remind you again that Jordan will be presenting next week. That's Jordan Brennan, and he's going to look at how some of the dynamics that Jonathan has explored today apply to Canada. So he'll be presenting uh, this, this coming Tuesday. Right. Yeah, I will show you in a minute uh, the presentation so you can see this is it. So it'll be this coming Tuesday, so it's in seven days' time, same place, um, and at 2.30. Thank you very much.